Okay, um, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, let's uh, start today's uh, morning session. And uh, uh, today uh, our first speaker is uh, Tommaso, and uh, he will continue from what was being done uh, yesterday. Um, I hope uh, some of you could. Uh, so let me quickly ask. Uh, how many of you could access his uh, slides from uh, from yesterday? Nobody. Yeah, a few. Well, uh, it, it is possible to access them. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, so we'll try to make those available on the Slack. And yeah. uh, yes. And how many of you could attempt uh, some of the exercise, the main uh, code that was given? Not many. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, welcome and let's start the session. Okay, so welcome back. I, I realized by looking back at uh, yesterday's slides and also today's that it's a lot of material to take in and you also have other lectures. And so it's quite hard, I realize, to, to keep your attention going for all of these boring slides. Um, however, I don't think there's another way because uh, we are compressing a lot uh, all of this material in, uh, in a few hours that we have together. So, well, I think, I think the slides are, are written in a way that should be available, should be possible for you to go through them offline and to digest the material slowly because uh, I, I don't think anybody can take all of this in uh, at, the first, uh, at the first shot. So don't, don't feel uh, like you are being uh, left behind in any way. Raise your hands and ask questions if you don't remember what was said yesterday about something that we discussed today. Don't worry about interrupting, okay? Please, please do. It's, uh, these lectures are for you. I've given them so many times that I bore myself to death by giving these lectures. So, but you see them for the first time, and so you are the user. I'm here for you, so please ask questions and interrupt, okay? So yesterday, one of the things that uh, I, I challenged you to do was to actually take on this uh, simplified problem of reconstructing uh, atmospheric showers, uh, you know, we have a, a proton or a photon that uh, enters the atmosphere, we say vertically, we say we fix the energy to a certain value, then this, this produces a shower of particles that has, we said that it has a Laplace distribution on the ground, so the, the joining at zero of two negative exponentials, so we model that this flux uh, as a certain constant uh, times an exponential. And this, uh, and this uh, in one dimension, we said is already integrating the fact that you have detector of a certain size, so they absorb a certain amount of particles. So everything is inside this flux uh, function. I called it lambda, I think. And, and then we tried to reconstruct the shower given uh, an array of a few detectors put on a straight line. Hmm? And uh, this is a one-dimensional case, and you have particles coming in, and you count these particles in your detectors. They are counters. They can see the number of particles. And these are Poisson variates. And from those Poisson variates, you construct the likelihood, and you can maximize the likelihood. It's very easy to do it one dimension. You just scan the, the space of x values and find the maximum of this function with a program. It's, it's, uh, it's very easy to do it. It starts to be difficult when you actually have two or more dimensions, because then you have to actually do the full calculation when you derive the logarithm of the likelihood with respect to the parameters and set that to zero for all of the parameters in turn. But uh, we saw when you have a sum of many terms, this is not uh, 
this becomes a more challenging computer program. But okay, I, I, I did the exercise, unlike you, <laughs> and this is the result, actually I think I lied here, this is 20 detectors, I, I made my program uh, flexible enough that I could have an array as big as I want, but this is just one line of code, right? And uh, I plotted the first 20 profiles after generating a thousand showers. And for each shower, I reconstruct the likelihood, and the likelihood is this, uh, is this uh, function. Uh, now, since it's negative, root will plot it uh, with uh, negative bars, so it looks like uh, it is this function. But what, what matters is the, the high point that this likelihood reaches. And the high point is uh, typically uh, the high point of a parabola. And if you remember the central limit theorem, whatever you have, if you put together many sums of many uh, contributions, you get a Gaussian distribution. And what is the exponentially, in an exponential, uh, so if you take the logarithm of the, of, of the Gaussian distribution, what you get is a quadratic function, a parabola. And so that is why the likelihood often shows, not always, but it often shows a parabolic shape. A parabolic shape is what you expect if all of the data in these detectors more or less follow the, the expectation value of the flux inside each of them. Uh, but you can have situations where, in fact, uh, you had uh, more flux in some detectors here and then it looks like the center of the array is here, but in fact, uh, the other rest, the rest of the data point to another point being the center of the shower. Because here we are reconstructing the x value, the, the, the center of the shower in these cases, okay? So you see that the likelihood can be non-parabolic. And it can, be, it can have a different maxima. So one lesson here, I will make the point in another slide, is that you can have more, multiple maxima for a likelihood, and you have to choose the highest. That is your maximum likelihood estimate, OK? So in all of these cases, as well, I was able to pick the i point here, just take the maximum as you iterate over x0. And then you can plot the residual of the best uh, uh, result that you get, the maximum likelihood estimate, and the true value. And you see that, that we are not doing very bad here. We have, a, we have an RMS of five meters. So we have 20 detectors uh, with this kind of flux. So we get uh, a rather precise positioning of the center of your shower. And then you can also do, using the rao kramer fresche bound, uh, here I did 10,000 trials to have more precision, you can actually estimate uh, the variance by, by the inverse of the second derivative of the likelihood. And there you will have to compute the derivative, the second derivative of the logarithm of the likelihood with respect to, to the parameter x0. And how do you do it? Well, it's a, it's a chain derivation, right? Don't let me do it, but, uh, well, it, we, we wrote the likelihood as, I wrote the likelihood as a product of the, over the detectors of Poisson terms, right? E to the minus lambda, lambda to the number that detected divided by factorial of n. And then we take the logarithm of this function. This becomes a sum of logarithms of the same thing. And if you work it out, uh, you see that the factorial, uh, uh, when you take the logarithm and you do the derivative with respect to x0, x0 is contained in lambda. So the denominator doesn't play any longer. And the logarithm of the exponential is just minus lambda. So this becomes, um, I'll go this way. This becomes uh, the logarithm of lambda divided by the x0 equals minus lambda. Uh, sorry, d over the x0 of minus lambda, because uh, the, the logarithm of the exponential is minus the number, plus n logarithm of lambda. And we forget the, the factorial term. And this becomes minus uh, d lambda over dx0 
uh, well, actually this becomes the lambda time divided by the x zero, and this is n over lambda minus one. And then we have to take the second derivative, and if you do the second derivative, well, do by it by yourself, it's easy. You get uh, uh, the rao kramer fréchet bound on the variance, and uh, you can then plot the, the, the ratio between these delta values and the estimated variance, for uh, square root of the variance for each of the shower. So the, this, this, uh, the second derivative of the likelihood will, will, will change every time. But then you, you get a ratio, which you see is nicely Gaussian, and it has an RMS which is close to one. That means that the rao kramer fresche bound works in this case. It estimates the variance well. You have a, a slight imprecision, because actually that was a lower bound that you're putting at the, at the denominator. OK, so that's a success. We reconstruct showers with a likelihood method. Um, so let us go back to our, and this is, uh, this is instead uh, the other thing that we were discussing yesterday. Uh, and we will proceed with our program of trying to understand what happens uh, to this covariance, to this uh, problem of making the average of two values that have a common uh, normalization error. And here there is another challenge for you because I just discovered a minute ago that this uh, result here might be wrong. First of all, I'm not any longer sure about these squares. There is certainly one square missing here somewhere. But this becomes a challenge for you now. Please, co please correct me and find the mistake in this calculation. Uh, so I have written a program that uh, can compute this, uh, this uh, weighted average with correlation from these equations, but uh, it's bugged because the calculation is wrong. So it's an algebraic problem. It's really a fifth grader problem to solve this. You put delta chi squared, you, you, you take the derivative of the chi square over k, which is your uh, variable of interest, and put it to zero, and you solve the re resulting equation for k, it should fill up uh, one sheet of paper, not two, okay? So at the end of it, you get this result, and uh, you substitute uh, uh, for, for the variance, you get this number. So anyways, uh, this holds. So the, 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 the average value will, in some cases, where the uh, uh, non-diagonal uh, uh, factorization scale, if you want uncertainty, will drive the weighted average uh, beyond and in particular below the boundary of the two measurements that you have. But the actual formula, I leave it to you. So, um, so yes, here I had uh, put together this computer program and I wanted to play with it, but uh, since the formula is actually not correct, uh, I let you correct it for me, okay? So instead, let's move on. Because what we saw was uh, maybe an accident. So remember, we specified the covariance matrix and we wrote it uh, freely. We said, okay, I have a part that is uh, depending on, only on x1 and a part that depends only on x2. So the two diagonal elements of the covariance matrix have this uncorrelated part, and then there is a correlation, and I take it to be multiplying the values that I get. So you get this scale uncertainty. But the covariance matrix you wrote, it's a model. It's not a truth, OK? You interpret your experimental situation by saying that there is a scale uncertainty, and therefore, my covariance matrix should have this form. But this might not actually be what really happens. Uh, and uh, the covariance matrix might actually not reflect. Um, so this is the result that we were getting uh, when uh, there is this uh, uh, when there is this, uh, this problem. And uh, we can take uh, this result uh, for the best estimate of our weighted average in the presence of this scale uncertainty. 
which now we don't even know if it is the correct form. I think it is, but okay. Uh, the, the variance may be wrong. Uh, and uh, compare it with the result that we have gotten when there is no correlation. So we dig a little bit further in the matter and try to understand what's going on. So the formulas here, uh, provided that they are correct, say that in presence of a scale systematic uncertainty, the weighted average gets downweighted by this term at the denominator. And this term is stronger if you have a stronger correlation, of course, and it is stronger if the two values that you are averaging are different. So this determines the, the, the amount by means by which you, you change the uncorrelated weighted average by, by adding something at the denominator and drawing down the prediction, okay? So, we can take the ratio of these two and we get this uh, even uglier expression, but maybe you see now that it's, uh, the ratio is one over one, so it's one if this distance is zero, and it is start to be smaller than one because the denominator grows, because this is a positive term, uh, depending on sigma f, okay? So, uh, what we say is that least the square feet is squeezing the scale, so it's making k hat smaller by an amount allowed by this uh, correlation term in order to minimize the chi square. Because then minimize the, the chi square gets uh, gets uh, better; it uh, decreases if you if you if you let this term play in more. Uh, and this is actually a pathology of this construction because the, the individual variances, sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, are not getting rescaled when you lower the normalization factor. The points get closer, but their uncertainty remains larger, so this, this term plays a larger effect. So, it's, it's maybe something uh, that uh, you could ignore, uh, but you should be aware that it can happen. And if the fact that it can happen uh, will, uh, will result clearly when we actually take in consideration a covariance matrix which is written in the most general possible form. Uh, because now here we had chosen a particular form of the, of the covariance matrix. So we will have to redo the exercise again. So we had defined the, the covariance matrix uh, this way. It's a particular way of writing it. It might be something that... Uh, produces a weird result in particular cases, okay? But the point I want to make is that this expression contains estimates of the true value, x1, x2, not the true value itself in these cross-correlation terms. And uh, I made the point that when you were, we were looking at the Neyman and Pearson chi-squared for the, for the average of Poisson terms, that this is a, a problem, right? You get a bias when you use the estimate uh, of, uh, of uh, your uncertainties in, in the derivation of your central value. Now, uh, you could try with a different formulation. You see, this again is a scale uncertainty that is correlated between the two measurements. But this time, uh, we are doing things uh, a la Pearson, instead of a la Neyman, in the sense that we are trying to substitute the true value, uh, the, the, the fitted value here for the, for the terms that, uh, that govern the correlation. Uh, if you do this and you do the exercise with this particular covariance matrix, you get this different chi squared, and uh, this produces the nice result that you were expecting without any correlation term playing at the denominator. So we are on the right track. Maybe we have actually resolved the paradox. So there is no paradox. The weighted average of two measurements will always be within the boundaries of the two. Because this k now is, uh, is going to be the same that you get uh, without the correlation term. Um, yeah, duh. I solved it now. Uh, so, and the, the same result that we just obtained uh, could be obtained if you just uh, uh, solve uh, the, the maximum likelihood equation where you can allow yourself to put estimates here, but because the likelihood expression knows, uh, knows uh, the, 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 
the, the distribution of the data that then you get, then you get uh, uh, a result that, uh, that is within the bounds. Or you can even uh, try this other formulation that uh, takes the scale uh, in a different form. Uh, I don't want to, to bore you to death with all of this. Uh, you see, I, uh, what I want you to get, though, is that you got really bored by this example. <laughs> you may remember that after you get out of that door. And that is good because that reminds you uh, next year, in three years, you will remember that there is something boring about this. There, is, there, is, there, are, there are intricacies. There are mathematical details. The way you write your covariance matrix matters. It changes the result. So this is a getaway point already. So I, I hope I'm, by boring you, I'm doing a good thing. So is there no paradox after all? Well, that is not true. There is the paradox. It's not a paradox. It's just that uh, you can take the most general possible form of the covariance matrix where you have no, made no assumptions on the way these uh, uncertainties combine. This is just uh, a covariance matrix that you are allowed to write in any possible case. So you have uh, individual variances, but you are not saying this part is correlated, this part is not correlated. You let the job be done by the correlation coefficient. And this is a general form of the covariance matrix. Actually, I think the most general form for a weighted average of two measurements. And if you do the exercise with this, you have let uh, everything be enshrined in the correlation coefficient. And we do the exercise of, again, taking the weighted average as the, the linear sum of the two terms so with a certain weight w. And uh, you will be forced to, to write uh, uh, it uh, this way. Uh, because if you minimize the chi square of this covariance uh, that results from this covariance matrix, you will get this result. So I've written it in a way that breaks it down into two different weights. And uh, now we can examine this. And uh, we can examine the variance. And uh, it returns, it's better to write the inverse variance that is uh, connected to this. And the inverse variance is equal to the inverse variance of the first measurement. I've singled out the first measurement in this mathematical expression, plus a term which can vanish if rho is equal to 1, but otherwise it's positive, right? Because rho is a number between minus 1 and plus 1, times a factor that can be positive or null. It can be null only for a particular choice of the correlation coefficient, which is equal to sigma 1 over sigma 2. And here I'm really taking no assumptions. I'm making the general case. This, this example is actually taken from Glenn Cowan's book, and you can find it there. So what we are looking at is uh, a uh, correlation between two measurements, and you take the weighted average, and you get the, the two results, uh, the, the result that is a, a linear sum of these two terms. And, and you have this funny expression for the variance. And we, we want to reason on this uh, variance. The first thing that, that I want to draw your attention to is that the combined measurement will have a smaller variance than the individual variances. For instance, if you have a certain variance for the first measurement, the weighted average has a smaller variance because the inverse variance is larger because this is a, this is a positive sign, unless the co correlation coefficient has this funny ratio of being sigma 1 over sigma 2 because sigma, sigma 1, sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 is uh, sigma 1 over sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 is 1 over sigma 2. Minus 1 over sigma 2 becomes 0. So there is one particular value of correlation which makes this term vanish. And then what happens is that uh, the variance of the combined measurement is equal to the variance of the first measurement. That means that the second measurement doesn't play in at all. It is like you have two measurements. One has a certain uncertainty. The other has a certain uncertainty. And you know what? I run the numbers. And the second measurement is useless. I, it doesn't shrink the variance. 
I, I'm used to believe that if I combine measurement, the total uncertainty is reduced. Yes, but not in this particular case where the, there is a particular ratio of, uh, of uh, variances between the two measurements and the, the correlation coefficient has exactly that ratio. So this is quite peculiar, I would say. And I must say that I encountered this, uh, uh, this situation in some combination of, uh, of uh, I remember a situation where CDF and D0 were measuring the top quark mass in several channels. You had the dilepton channel, the single lepton channel, the holodronic channels, different analyses that took into consideration different final states of the decay of top quark pairs, where you have jets or leptons. And by running the numbers, it re there was a situation when one of the weights of the various pieces of the combination became negative. This is what we are discussing here. Uh, when you are combining things, and uh, one of, the, one of the, the factors in the combination gets a weight of zero or even negative. If you have a weight of zero, it means that that particular result is like you took it away. You can take it away. It doesn't contribute. And that is because of this combination of numbers. If, uh, uh, but it can even be negative. So let's uh, look at these expressions again and make some points. If we take a measurement of a variable, a variance sigma 1 squared, a second measurement of the same quantity will reduce the variance of the average because of this plus sign and these squared terms unless the correlation coefficient is this ratio of variances, uh, of uh, um, errors. In that particular special case, no improvement in the variance can be had by adding the second measurement. And what happens if the correlation coefficient goes outside of that uh, bound? In that case, the weight W in this uh, linear expression becomes negative, and the average goes again outside of the psychological bound. So this effect that we had found uh, by an experimental covariance matrix, if you want, does exist, and you can get it. If you have a large correlation between two measurements, and the variances differ, you can get it. It's very, it, it's a little bit hard to digest, but this is what the math says, and there are no mistakes here because I cross-checked them, but they are also in Glenn's book. So the reason for this behavior is that with a large positive correlation, you have two results. You are trying to shoot at the target, which is the true value, and you take a shot, but you have some uncertainty, and uh, maybe uh, you take a shot because you are, you, you are a right-handed uh, uh, shooter, you, you tend to shoot on the left. So you, you, you err and you, you, you shoot at the, at the target, and this is the target, and uh, you shoot and you, and you get it a little bit on the left. And then you shoot again, but you are the same right-handed shooter, and so the two results are correlated. You still get some error, and you will get another result on the same side. So if you have a correlation between measurements, the results tend to get along with one another. So they don't distribute evenly around your central value. They are biased in one direction, if you want. And therefore, they tend to be on the same side. So uh, this fact makes the combined measurement in presence of correlation correctly going out of the bound. This is a little bit, this is a possible intuitive explanation, but I let you ponder on this. Uh, so I don't know what I have done, yes. So it seems a paradox, but it's not a paradox. Uh, but okay, and this also stems, if you want, by the fact uh, that we don't really uh, take in uh, correctly the, the the, the effect of correlations of results. So I have a discussion here between John and Jane, la, just to let you uh, sink in on this, uh, on this problem. So John says, I took a measurement, got the number x1. I am now going to take a second measurement of the same physical quantity with a larger variance of the first, because maybe I, I am taking less data, I don't know. Do you mean to say I will more likely get x1 greater than x1 if the mean is uh, lower than x1, so on the same side and even away 
more away from the true value, and x2 less than x1 if the mu, if the true value is larger than x1. So again, farther away from the mean on average, because this is what the equations say. And Jen says, that is correct. Your second measurement goes along with the first because your experimental conditions have made the two highly correlated and x1 is more precise. So on average, the second result will be farther away from the true value and on the same side of x1. We are reasoning on expectation values, of course, average values. And John says, but this means my second measurement is utterly use useless. I just can take the first one, right? And uh, James says, no, this is wrong. It will, in general, reduce the combined variance. In general, though, except for the very special case of rho equals sigma 1 over sigma 2, when uh, the, the second measurement is useless, in fact, the weighted average will converge to the true value of mu, because least square estimators are, after all, consistent. But consistency is an asymptotic property. And John says, I still can't figure out how on Earth the average of two numbers can be outside of their range. It fights with my common sense. So John says, well, I'll help you. I need to think you, I need you to think in probabilistic terms. So look at this error ellipse, the famous error ellipse we discussed yesterday, right? It is thin and it is tilted. So thin means that there is a large correlation and tilted uh, means that one of the two variances is much larger than the other. Do you see it? So the variance on the vertical axis is smaller than the variance on the horizontal axis. High correlation, large difference in variances. Uh, okay. So please, would you pick a few points at random within the ellipse? What does this mean? It means that you are simulating the act of measuring the variables x1 and x2. Uh, taking values of x1 and x2 by staying within one sigma, okay? So uh, spanning this, uh, this uh, region of one sigma interval around the true value. Uh, but the, the, the center of the ellipse is not the true value, is the, is the, the average of the measurement, okay? Okay, so what happens now is that you should count how many points you have on the same side where the two variables are both positive or when they are both negative. So they are both representing a negative fluctuation or both representing a positive fluctuation. They are on the same side, if you want. Well, here we are making the conceptual leap of thinking that the true value is here. But uh, you see that uh, most of the points in this case lie on the same side. They are both positive or both negative fluctuations. And Jane says, that's because the correlation makes them likely to go along with one another, right? I hope this is clear now. And I can actually make it even easier for you, says Jane. Take a two-dimensional plane, draw the axis, draw the bisector of the axis, and, uh, and then you have uh, an ellipse, and we center the ellipse on a point along the diagonal. So you have the two measurements, and the diagonal represents the true value, which you don't know where it is. But uh, uh, the, uh, when you have the true value, the true value means that the two values here are the same. I, uh, here, maybe it's a little bit tilted, but this would be a diagonal of bisector of the axis. So now you put in two measurements. You measure x1 equals a and x2 equals b. And you get this point, and uh, this is a point on the plane, a possible measurement point. Um, now, to find the best estimate for mu, what the chi-squared method does for you is to find an ellipse that passes through your data point. So the ellipse uh, has uh, a fixed shape because the correlation coefficient is fixed, and the variances are fixed. So you can shrink the ellipse, move it along the diagonal with its center on this diagonal axis. And you have to pass through this point. This is what the least square method does. It tries to find the minimum chi-squared, which is it finds the minimum ellipse that uh, passes through this data point. Mathematically, this is what it does. 
John notices that there are an infinity of ellipses that fulfill the requirement of passing through this point P and having the center on the diagonal. And that is true. And that is why the minimization uh, requires you to do some mathematics to compute. Uh, yes, says Jane, that's correct. There are an infinity of ellipses, but we are only interested in the smallest ellipse. And because that's a minimization problem. Its center will give you the best estimate of mu given A and B, given the ratio of the variances, and given the correlation. And John says, now I see it. It is bound to be outside of the interval, because you see the center here is uh, falling outside of the window A or B. We, I will have a better graph then uh, in the next slide. And John says, no, that is not true. It, the, the best estimate is outside of the interval only because the ellipse that you have drawn is thin and its angle with the diagonal is significant. In general, the result depends on how large is the correlation and how different the variances are. So let's look at the situation in a better graph. Uh, you have A and B, and you have the best estimate here, which is the smallest ellipse. I draw two other ellipses here to show that you are minimizing the ellipse as you move along this uh, axis with the center of the, of the ellipses. And you see that the, the least square estimate fall outside of the bound in this particular case. There is another thing that this point has the tangent equal to the, the diagonal, but OK, that's a geometric fact. And this only happens if you have a positive correlation. It doesn't happen with neg negative correlations, OK? It's a peculiarity of having two measurements with a positive correlation and large difference in variances. Um, so this is my own little contribution to this problem, because this kind of graph, I've never seen it anywhere. I, 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 I put it up, I put it together to try to understand what the chi-square is doing in a geometrical fashion. But OK, uh, so we have looked at this problem in excruciating detail, but I think we have a few take-home lessons. Even the, sh the, the simplest possible problem of doing a combination of measurements is really difficult in presence of correlations. And oftentimes, you have to take uh, assumptions. You will see when you practice uh, in hadron collide, I, I, in particle physics in general, that sometimes you have to combine measurements. You have different groups that produce different measurements. And they have to agree on what is uh, the correlation between their uh, uncertainties. Because there will be a common PDF error. There will be a common luminosity error. There will be a common jet energy scale uncertainty if they have all used the same uh, uh, simulation for the, how the jets interact with the calorimeter. There will be correlated systematics if you are measuring the top quark mass at the LHC or whatever. The top quark mass at the LHC, look it up if you want. There are papers that describe this combination. And they rightly go in depth in looking at the correlation between the various things. And you will also notice that what they do in the end is not a great job, because they decide that, OK, we take these two measurements, to these two uncertainties to be 100% correlated, and we take these other uncertainties to be 0% correlated. Uh, several papers do this. They either assume full correlation or zero correlation between the individual systematic uncertainties that enter into the combination. And this combination is big because you have many different pieces of the systematic uncertainty that are part of the correlation problem. And this, uh, this weighted average measurement will be done typically with a thing that is called blue which is the best linear unbiased uh, estimate. And there is, uh, there is uh, an algorithm that you can download and uh, try it yourself. And then somebody came up uh, with the fact that even blue is biased, and then you can do some iterative version of blue that uh, has less correlation. And so this is actually an active research topic how to do the combination of a few measurements in presence of correlations. Just to tell you how complicated this is, that we still haven't solved it, 
a hundred years after the statisticians uh, <laughs> found everything that there was to know about statistics in theory. So, I will leave this topic now, but uh, uh, you can look it up and, uh, and uh, you, we will verify that things are really complicated. Okay, you can even try it at home. Imagine that you have a table. Imagine that you want to measure uh, this uh, position. You have a stick that you place at some point on an edge of the table, allegedly vertically, also orthogonally to this axis, but maybe you make a small mistake and you have a, a certain uncertainty on how you place this stick. Anyways, you want to measure this distance and you have a ruler, but the ruler is not long enough. So you think uh, you, you do something uh, weird. You have a second stick of fixed length A and you take a measurement of this distance D1 by placing the, 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 the yellow stick uh, at, uh, at this point and taking this distance with the ruler, or you put it at this point and take this distance with the ruler. And you will see that uh, if you have made a mistake in placing the red stick, the two values, D1 and D2, which should measure the same quantity if this is vertical, are correlated with one another. And there is, uh, uh, and there is uh, uh, you can work out this example and you will find that, that you fall in the same situation that we just described mathematically. But there is a, a better example that comes from, uh, from particle physics. And uh, so let's look at measurements that involve hadronic jets. We discussed jets even yesterday, so I think uh, we don't need to introduce them, right? But okay, in proton collisions, you have quarks and gluons that get kicked out very violently from the point uh, uh, of the collision from the center, from, from the protons. And this generates streams of hadrons that then interact with your calorimeter. Imagine a flux of hadrons here. Here actually I simulated a single proton and it produces a very stochastic hadronic shower. Uh, so, okay, and then theorists uh, uh, have, uh, have their, their hands full in calculating the effects of uh, all the quantum chromodynamic effects and all the uh, what happens when in these particles uh, fragment and interact. And so uh, these, uh, these jets are difficult to measure in the calorimeter. The calorimeter pictures the total energy that uh, is deposited by these hadrons, but they are subject to fluctuations that are scale uncertainties, there are uh, fragmentation uncertainties, there are PDF uncertainties. So there are a number of subtle effects. So the measurement we are discussing now is a measurement uh, of the cross-section of pairs of jets. So CDF, the CDF experiment at the Tevatron Collider, that was a 2TV proton-antiproton collider active at uh, Fermilab uh, from the mid-80s to 2012, uh, did this experiment in 1996. So it uh, collected events with two high-energy jets and tried to measure the differential cross-section of these events as a function of the invariant mass of the two jets. So to measure the invariant mass of the two jets, you need to measure their energy and their direction, and then you combine, okay? And uh, this, this distribution is actually a very fast falling exponential because it's much easier to find the partons with low fraction of momentum in the proton and antiproton, so it is much easier to find events at very low invariant mass of the two jets. So what we are looking at a vertical scale, it's a semi-log plot where this spans uh, six or seven orders of magnitude in the rate. So you have uh, uh, millibarns here and you have picobarns here, all right? So, but this is, uh, this is the kind of shape that you get. And CDF set out to measure it precisely. And, uh, uh, okay, you collect events with two jets, uh, you measure the energies and the angles. And uh, the culprit here is the energy measurement because of all these uh, systematic effects that we discussed. And uh, what, when you are done counting your events and measuring their energy and mass, you compare to the quantum chromodynamics theory prediction by subtracting the, the model, the theoretical prediction itself, so you can study better the difference. Because you have something that spans six orders of magnitude, you want to actually study the difference with the theory prediction 
on a, on a horizontal line rather than looking at the points that have a very, very small uncertainty bars. And another thing to note is that QCD predictions depend on the parametrization that you choose, crucially, for the distribution of the partons in the protons. So the shape of this differential cross-section depends on the model that you use for the PDFs. You use uh, the CTEC model, you get a certain shape. You use the uh, MRST model, you get a different shape. So it is very interesting to actually compare the data to these models to understand which model is better, OK? One of you made me, asked me a question between Tizia, Irving, and Sherpa yesterday. I don't know who, I don't, yeah, down there. So this is uh, more or less uh, the kind of thing that uh, we are doing in this particular example, comparing uh, some data to different theory models and uh, trying to understand. In your problem, you want to find the best test statistic. Here we will see that we were doing it with a chi-squared. So pretty much what you are doing also. So here are the data once you subtract uh, the QCD model. But the model we subtract is the standard uh, CTEC for M parton distribution set. And you see that these points should line up at zero because uh, if the data and the model are perfectly in agreement, that's what you would get as a function of digit mass. But you see that the CDF data points uh, have, a, have a slope. They tend to rise at very high mass. This is one effect that uh, uh, perplexed the CDF experimentalists. At the beginning, they thought that they had uh, discovered uh, prions, that is, uh, constituents of quarks. Because that's what uh, we would expect if the quarks were not point-like, but actually contained the structure. You would get an excess of events at very high uh, digit mass. In fact, uh, there were also there was a media storm that uh, surrounded uh, these these events that CDF had collected because uh, somebody started to talk to the media saying, "Okay, will this uh, famously Giorgio Bellettini, who is uh, the head of the Italian team uh, in the CDF experiment, uh, was interviewed uh, uh, by the Chicago Tribune, I think, and he said, uh, "Someday I wake up and I think it's uh, QCD." And some days I wake up and I think it's new physics. We were really in that situation. We were seeing an excess that was really reminiscent of what you have in Rutherford scattering, where you get an excess of high, high angle deviations. You have an excess of interactions that give, uh, uh, give, uh, give rise to the idea that you have substructure that you're seeing inside the point-like objects that you're colliding. But here we have a different problem. We assume that the standard model is correct, only we don't know what the standard model is. That is, we know what the standard model is, but we don't know what uh, model for the parton distribution function to fit, to feed inside the standard model. So you have different QCD predictions, and you see them here. The standard ctec 4 m set of predictions gives this uh, line at zero, because we are subtracting that model. But if we subtract that model to the data and we compare to the MRST model, we would get a different uh, uh, place for the data points under the null assumption. And if we have other sets, we would get different shapes again. So the question to you is, uh, which of these five models, well, forget this thick curve here, because this was added after the fact. This is uh, an addition post-publication, and uh, it is the result of fitting the PDF uh, models, uh, the CTEC model, by adding this data. So it is illegal to compare the data to a model that includes the, those data to be, uh, to be tuned, OK? So let's omit this, uh, this shape here. I, I was one of the reviewers of this analysis uh, back then. And I was really startled by the conclusions that uh, were coming out by crunching the numbers. So which of these four models, one, two, three, four, do you think is the better model to fit these data? And one thing I, we didn't discuss, this yellow band, the elephant in the room, because these uh, vertical uh, uncertainty bars are just the statistical uncertainties propagating the number the Poisson variations in the number of jets that we see at different energies. 
But what matters the most here is the systematic uncertainty, which is this yellow band. And you see that this is a significant band, the 20% or 30% uncertainty. And it is because, first of all, it looks big, but if you look at it on six orders of magnitude, you will not be able to see it. The data are very precise. But once you blow up the uncertainties because you are just taking the difference with the QCD shape, you see this systematics. <coughs> so the systematic uncertainty comes from several effects, as we were discussing. Fragmentation function uncertainties, jet energy scale uncertainties, uh, detector effects. And many of these effects are correlated along the axis. So you can't have a variation here that is different from the variation that you have here. So they go along with one another, OK? So we are in a bigger and meaner situation than the two weighted average, two measurements weighted average. Here we have several measurements, and we have lots of systematics. So who prefers this thick line here, this line at zero, as the best model? Raise your hands. Who likes this of the four models the best? Who would pick that model as the one that you use for your PhD thesis? Nobody likes the, the thick, the, this line at zero? Who among you prefers this uh, dot dashed line here? Nobody wants to. You, you like that. Who likes the dotted line here? Three, four, okay. And who likes this, uh, uh, this uh, thick uh, dashed line below here? One. Okay, many have not, two, three. Many have not expressed their views. You prefer to, to keep it to yourself. Okay, we'll have a little bit of suspense. But notice one thing, that the data are all on this side, okay? So the... The simplest thing to, to, to do would be to pick the model that is the closest to the data point, right? So this med model, I think, uh, should be preferred because it's closer to the data points. It even intercepts a little bit of the one sigma band of the systematic uncertainty. And the other models are further away. So when we reason with the chi-square, we know that the chi-square is a squared difference between data and model. So the more you go away from the data, from the model, the more you have to pay in terms of chi-squared. And you pay quadratically. So if you take one step, you pay one. And if you take two steps, you pay four. So the more you go away, the more you pay. And so should we prefer this line at zero? Well, you have to run the numbers, but you have to take in mind that, keep in mind that you have large systematic uncertainties and systematic uncertainties, if they are correlated, change totally the stipulation. Because you don't get to pay one if you move away by one sigma, and four if you make a, if move away by four sigma, by two sigma, for any, each of the points. Because if you do it with the chi-square, each of the point has this thing, that if you move away by one sigma, you pay one, and if you move away by two sigma, you pay four, summed over all the points. If the systematics are fully correlated, all of the points can take a jump by one sigma and pay one. Only one, not 20, because you have 20 data points. So because of the correlation, you pay a much smaller price by moving away. Instead, what the systematics can accommodate by just a covariant shift of all the points is when you have to move some points up more and some points up less, or vice versa. Because that's what the systematic, the correlated systematics don't want to do, because they want you to move everything coherently, because there is this correlation that moves everything coherently. So you have two different competing effects here. The vertical statistical error bars each of them has to pay a large price when you move away from the model, and quadratically so. And uh, then you have the systematic uncertainty also quadratically pays a price for being away from the model. But you, if you move coherently, you pay a much smaller price than if you move incoherently. 
So I've sort of given it away because the result is that the MRST model, which is this dotted line here, has a p-value of agreement with the data point that is 30 times larger than the line of zero. So what it means is that this model is 30 times less probable than this model, or better, because I'm doing a probability inversion statement here, that the probability of the data, given the CTEC 4M model, is 30 times uh, smaller than the probability of the data given the MRST model. This is what a frequentist does. Talks about the probability of the data given the model. But still, there's a factor of 30, okay? And the factor of 30 arises because this shape is ever so slightly similar to the shape of the data. Can you see it? So, what is the getaway point? Be careful with the least square fits in the presence of large common systematics. I think by now you should know this, right? And don't trust your eye when your data points carry significant bin-to-bin -bin correlations, all right? And this is a lesson I learned by, by looking at this very example oh, some 25 years ago. All right, so uh, I have for you, uh, let's move on. I have for you a little uh, compilation of notes on the maximum likelihood method, which by now we have digested and we have seen several times. Uh, the reason why there is uh, this uh, reprise of the like zero deer in this uh, uh, set of slides is uh, because uh, we have picked up a few competencies along the way, so we want to focus on this uh, again. But I go a little bit fast on this, but please interrupt me if something is not clear. So again, if you want, uh, we can take a random variable x with a certain PDF, which depends on some parameters. I think by repeating this, uh, you will be uh, likely to pick up things a bit uh, easier, more easier now, right? Uh, we assume that we know the PDF, but we don't know the parameter. So we use some data to estimate the parameter field. And uh, if we have independent measurement, then the probability to obtain this data set is given by the product of the, of the PDFs. And uh, then you can write a likelihood function. And uh, uh, the maximum likelihood estimate can be obtained by maximizing this function. The likelihood here, one point that uh, uh, is important to make is that is a function of the parameter theta and not of the data, okay? You can only write it once you have the data in your hands. And then, uh, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate can be obtained when you set the derivative to zero. We have seen that we tend to measure, want to measure the minus the logarithm of the likelihood and the take uh, the minimization of this function because we have written programs that do minimization pretty well. Doing maximization would mean uh, rewriting code, <laughs> so we take a minus sign there, okay? Uh, so minuit, if you run it, uh, you can do likelihood fitting or k square fitting, and it's uh, seamless uh, by just taking the minus sign. Um, one point that I was more making a moment ago is that uh, there will be more local maxima. That's because uh, of the stochastic nature of your data, because if you are in asymptotic regime, the likelihood is parabolic. The data approaches the Gaussian, likelihood is parabolic, you have only one maximum. But when you have few events, when you have uh, 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 uncertainties, etc., the likelihood can have those funny shapes that we saw before. One important point we didn't make yet, the likelihood needs to be differentiable. You need to be able to compute derivatives, otherwise you don't know what to do, okay? And the, the first derivative also needs to be differentiable because you want the second derivative also to exist. And uh, one important point we didn't make yet is that the maximum of the likelihood needs to be away from the boundary of the definition of the parameter. Now, you will remember that uh, we make, made an example called die.c, a program that you have available in that area. 
And actually, we are going to run it to, to test something because with that program, we can check that this is really a problematic region. You will remember that the load on the die is uh, defined between minus one sixth and plus one third. If uh, we set the parameter close to the boundary and we run some toys, we will see that the likelihood intervals that we can extract with the Rao Kramer Frechet bound do not cover. That's the topic which we will get at uh, at the end of the second lecture today, coverage. And we will see the coverage properties of likelihood intervals. And we will see that they are especially bad when the parameter you are estimating is close to its boundary of validity. In those situations, you better not use the Rao Kramer Frechet bound at all because you're going to get the wrong result. But we'll get there. Uh, so we said that the likelihood is, uh, is the best method in many cases when you know the PDF, and it has many desirable properties. One thing we didn't see, say is that it has uh, a nice transformation invariance. So imagine that you have a function of the parameter theta, and you have your likelihood which depends on theta. The derivative of the likelihood with respect to theta is equal to the derivative of the likelihood with respect to g times the g over the theta. So what this means, a simple, uh, uh, simple uh, chain rule of the derivatives, but uh, when you set both members to zero, this means that if uh, theta hat is the maximum likelihood estimate of theta, then the maximum likelihood estimate of g, the function of theta, is g hat, which is g of theta hat. So you just plug in the estimate for theta, and you get the estimate of a function of theta seamlessly, OK? So that's a very nice property. But there is a catch, though. You may have a parameter estimate which is unbiased, but then the derived estimate might be biased. So you might uh, turn out to have a bias in the function of the parameter by doing this. OK, you need to know that. Uh, so for a Gaussian PDF, uh, this is the log likelihood that you are looking at because you plug in the function uh, a Gaussian inside here, mu and sigma squared as the function that define the Gaussian, the, the parameters that define the Gaussian. And this is what you get. You have two normalization factors, and then you have this uh, nice quadratic uh, coefficient, which determines the shape of the likelihood near the maximum, OK? Uh, and so we are. I think we have already made this calculation. We get that the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean of a Gaussian is just the sample average. This is actually proving that the sample average is uh, the maximum likelihood estimate for um, for the mean of the Gaussian. Uh, and uh, we can prove that the sample mean is unbiased uh, we, by reasoning with expectation values. I let you go through this uh, uh, calculation at home because it's trivial, but you get what you want. Okay, there is no bias for the sample mean. Instead, uh, what we said for the mu is not true for the sigma. The uh, if we take the derivative of the log likelihood over the variance, uh, that the mean, the, the sigma of the Gaussian, uh, by doing the same calculation, we get this expression. You know, mu and sigma are the two parameters of our PDF. So we, to get the estimates of these two parameters, we differentiate with respect to them. Before, we have differentiated with respect to mu. Now, we differentiate with respect to sigma. We get this expression. We set it to 0. We get the estimate of the variance. And the estimate of the variance is 1 over n of the quadratic term x minus mu squared, which is not surprising, of course, but it is not the expectation value. So uh, it is not uh, the, the, it is biased. So the expectation value that we have computed uh, for, for this uh, estimate, sigma squared hat, is not sigma squared, the, the true parameter, the true variance of the Gaussian. It is n minus 1 over n. It has this uh, bias factor, which goes to 0 for large n, but it is not 0, not 1, OK? 
So the bias is van vanish uh, for, for large n, as always. There is an unbiased estimator for the Gaussian sigma, and it is called sample variance. This 1 over n minus 1 is called Bessel correction, and uh, you see that there is a difference between these two. This is not the maximum likelihood estimator, which is biased in this case. That's life. We have also discussed uh, the rao kramer ferche bound. Again, I don't think we need to go through it. But yes, one thing is uh, to define what is the UMVU, the uniformly minimum variance and biased estimator for a parameter is the one that has minimum variance possible for any of the values of the unknown parameter it estimates. So regardless what is the parameter, the uh, estimator that gets the minimum variance exists. Uh, if it exists, uh, it's called the UMVU. And the form of this estimator depends on the distribution. No wonder, right? So depending on the problem that you have at hand, you will have to choose the estimator that is doing the job the best. And uh, we discussed uh, the Rao Kramer Frechet bound, so I won't go into that. Uh, we also, I think, uh, discussed efficiency and robustness. And uh, an example of, uh, of uh, this kind that you can make is the sample mean is uh, the UMVU estimator of the mean if, the, if you have a Gaussian distribution. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, the uniformly minimum variance and biased estimator for the center of the distribution is the sample mean, which is also the maximum likelihood estimate. But for non-Gaussian distribution, this might not be the best choice for the center of the distribution. And we will see exactly this case when we look at the opera measurement of the neutrino speeds. And now let's... Uh, uh, discuss the mid-range. What is the mid-range? The, if you have a distribution of, of data points on, on an axis, and the midpoint is the halfway between the last and the first point, okay? The midpoint is the center of a distribution of points, but not uh, taking the average, just taking the halfway between the two extrema, okay? And this is the uniformly minimum variance and biased estimator for the mean of a uniform distribution. And this is very easy to realize, right? Because if you have a uniform box distribution, which is made like this, you have data points uh, somewhere, and the center of the distribution is determined by the two extrema. So you take the two extremes, so you take the halfway, and you get a good estimate for the center of this box distribution, and that is actually the uniformly minimum variance and bias estimator for the location of the box. And it does a better job than the sample mean in this case. Why this is relevant, we'll see it in a second. Now, both the sample mean and the sample mid range we have discussed are efficient estimators, and uh, for other distribution, they are not efficient. And, uh, okay, we also discussed robust estimators. Now, let's go to the opera measurement of neutrino speed. In 2011, uh, there was this experiment active at uh, the Gran Sasso tunnel, and there is a laboratory under, the, under a, a big mountain in central Italy, and it's uh, covered by so much rock that it's a perfect place for laboratory on cosmic rays because cosmic rays get shielded by the rock and uh, you get a very low background. So you can study, for instance, neutrinos that uh, can penetrate uh, the rock a lot more than any other cosmic ray particle. And you can also shoot at uh, these uh, detectors underground uh, with a beam of neutrinos from CERN. 730 kilometers away, you have the CNGS beam, which is a beam of protons. They collide with a target, produce pions and kaons, Pions and kaons decay to muons and neutrinos, and the neutrinos can be directed in the direction of the Gran Sasso tunnel. And this is what uh, the CNGS is doing, is uh, uh, spewing lots of bunches of protons uh, uh, and producing lots of neutrinos, and some of these neutrinos appear in the detector 730 kilometers downstream. And the opera measurement is made of bricks uh, of lead uh, interspersed uh, with uh, nuclear emulsions. 
so that they can track very, very precisely the interactions that neutrinos do when they reappear by charged current interaction in the dense matter. And what OPERA did, uh, they were looking for the appearance of the tau neutrino in a beam originally made of muon neutrinos, okay? So they wanted to measure the oscillation of muon neutrinos to tau neutrinos. That was the main point of constructing OPERA. But some of the researchers in OPERA said, wait a minute, we have all these neutrinos traveling all this uh, rock, and nobody has measured, well, I think there were some measurements before, but we can measure precisely the time that the neutrinos take in traveling 730 kilometers. And so they did, they measured the difference in time between the bunch production of all these particles and the neutrinos that arrive at the detector. They had 20 neutrinos. These are the 20 neutrinos. It's a histogram of, with 20 entries. And here is plotted the time in nanoseconds. But this is not the time uh, it took the neutrinos to arrive to the mine, to the, to the tunnel, to the opera detector. It is the difference between the time uh, that, uh, that, they, that a photon would take in vacuum and the time that they took. And the difference is uh, positive because the neutrinos took, uh, well, it's the other way around. So the neutrinos apparently were taking less time than photons in vacuum to travel those 730 kilometers. So this was a measurement that appeared to show that neutrinos travel faster than light in contradiction with uh, relativity, you know, and everything that you know. And you see, you have, a, you have this distribution, it is quite unmistakably far away from zero. So you expect them to be traveling exactly at the speed of light in vacuum, but in fact, you find 60 nanosecond difference. And what is relevant here is not so much uh, what we are going to discuss, but the fact that all these measurements are pointing at a 60 nanosecond anticipation. This generated a lot of interest in the media, of course, etc. In 2011, you might even have, have heard about this. But then there were other measurements, and then they rechecked everything. Uh, it was a tedious process uh, when they looked at all the possible systematic uncertainties, uh, positioning measurements, uh, GPS, uh, and whatnot, and all of the, the details of the beam, etc. But in the end, they re realized that it was a loose cable that was reflecting the signal and causing a delay of 60 nanoseconds. So there is no superluminal motion detected in this experiment anyway at the end. But we are, we are more interested in the gory little details here. And you see this, uh, this uh, blue band here with the central measurement that the opera made with these 20 timing measurements. So what do they do? They have all this measurement of time, of arrival. What can you do? You take the average of them, right? Yeah, so that's what, uh, what they did. They took the average of these 20 timing measurements. Uh, now, the bunch structure of the CNGS beam is a box distribution. There is a bunch of protons. It's uh, almost uh, perfectly uh, a square bunch, so there is the same amount of protons that arrive at the target for like uh, 50 nanoseconds, uh, they arrive at the target, ba -ba 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 -bam, they produce uh, pions and, and kaons, this decay and arrive at opera. So you expect this distribution to be a box distribution, the time of arrival of the neutrinos, if all of the neutrinos have the same speed and, uh, well, they all travel at uh, the speed of light with uh, even if with very small delays. So you can take that assumption. So you expect this time of arrival to be a box distribution, and you look at it, and in fact, it is very nearly a box distribution, so very good. So what do you do? Opera, what they did, I was at a seminar in Padova when I saw this, and uh, they took the sample mean of the measurements, and the moment I saw this, I said, Wait a minute, this can't be right. <laughs> Do you see an issue with that choice? 
Well, I just told you what the UMVU is for the Gaussian, and I told you what the UMVU is for the uniform. So what is the UMVU for this measurement? Is it the sample mean? I don't think so. It is the sample mid-range. So they should have used the sample mid-range, not the sample mean. Does it make a difference? Well, not really, but it makes a difference in the uncertainty that they can quote. And we are physicists, and we want to, our uncertainties to be as small as possible. So, in fact, the sample mean is not the best choice of the estimator of the location of a box. And you actually know it very easily why it can't be. Because once you have this point here, and this point here, and you have a bunch of other measurements in between, the box is determined by this and this point. If you add information by using the location of all these other points, you're not changing by anything your best estimate, which is only determined by the extrema. This is noise. And the sample mean is using that noise to produce something which is not the best estimate. Instead, the sample mid range excludes all the noise and only looks at the extrema. Okay, that is why it is the best estimate for the location. And it's better than the sample mean. So the UMVU estimator for the box is the sample mid range, which is this one. And uh, I just told you this. So, and the larger the number of neutrinos that you have, the larger is the disadvantage of the, of the sample mean with respect to the sample mid range because you are adding more and more noise. It is uh, very straightforward to write a computer program that simulates the opera measurements. You just have to sample from a uniform distribution and then you compute the sample mean and you compute the sample mid range and you compare the variation of these two numbers. It's really, really five minutes of code. So why don't you do it? It's, it's nice. It, you, you study an experiment, and you can uh, have an insight that the experimenters themselves didn't have. So here is the result. And uh, you simulate 20 neutrinos 100,000 times. And you have these uh, numbers sampled from a 50 nanoseconds box distribution. And these are the residuals from the true value of the location for a sample mean. You see how nice a Gaussian this is. This is a parabola in semi-log plot. It's a Gaussian, OK? As you expect, because we are very close to asymptopia, and this is the, what the sample mid-range gives for the residuals. And uh, you can see that this is a narrower distribution. What this means is that the uncertainty on the location is smaller, OK? So the sample mean is this, and the sample mid range is this one. And this is a, a semi-log plot, and this is a linear plot, which shows better than this is a Gaussian, and shows just how much of an advantage you have by using the sample mid range. It's almost halving the, the uncertainty. Uh, Opera measured the, the uncertainty on the, on the delta time as 3.7 nanosecond, where the expected width is 3.24. So basically, this is a fluctuation due to the location of the points that they have. And you can study the residual of the sample mid-range, and you see that it is a Laplace distribution. There you have it, the Laplace distribution. That's the residuals of the sample mid-range for a uniform distribution. Uh, and uh, if, you, if Opera had used the, the sample mid-range, their expected uncertainty would have been uh, more than twice, time, twice smaller, OK? So if I talked, when I talked to my colleagues and said, did you see the Opera seminar? Don't you, don't you think that this is a really sloppy analysis that they did? Oh, but why are you, why are you looking at these details? The important thing is that they have proven that the neutrinos are superluminal, right? So this is the result. What, why, why do you care about uh, two nanoseconds uh, uncertainty? No, I do care. We are experimentalists. Uh, my, my, I mean, uh, 
My, my grandma could have seen that the neutrinos are superluminal by looking at the distribution, but we are scientists, we need to estimate things. We are experimental physicists. Our job is to make our uncertainties as small as possible. So to me, that was a really sloppy result. Okay? Now, the devil, the devil is in the details. As I think is transpiring from these lectures, uh, if you didn't know it already, First of all, there is one detail uh, that I glossed over, but we will get back to it uh, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and this detail is uh, on this uh, tiny little uh, red spot here. Why did I generate 100,000 times 20 events? Opera found 20 events by integrating for one year of data taking. That number, 20, is sampled from a distribution. What distribution do you think that is? Well, it depends on how the CERN beam is made, but you can expect this to be what? One session. A Poisson distribution. Yes, it's a Poisson distribution. It's a counting experiment. So why am I not generating a fluctuation in, when I simulate my toys? Why can't I let this number fluctuate every time I sample? This is a question we, I will answer tomorrow. And this has to do with what is called uh, ancillarity and conditioning, two important words in statistics. This statistic, the number of neutrinos, is an ancillary statistic. It's a, Something that has bearing on the uncertainty, on the results that you get, but not on the central value, the timing measurement. It has no, no, no bearing. It doesn't know about the central value, but it will know about the uncertainty on the central value of the time. If I generate more neutrinos, the central value will have a smaller uncertainty. If I generate less neutrinos because the fluctuation went down, I will have a larger uncertainty. Now, I want to test the opera conditions. I want to know what their uncertainty is. So I generate exactly 20 events 100,000 times. I don't let the number fluctuate because it will pollute my sample with cases which are not relevant to the case I'm studying. I want my measurement of the estimated uncertainty to be relevant to the opera one. I want to condition to the subspace of relevant subset of those conditions, those experiments that are actually telling me more about the true uncertainty that Opera should have gotten. This is a very important concept in statistics, and it's very little known, and we will ponder on that more. But that's why I generated 20 events all of the time. The other detail about this is that things change rapidly when we go towards asymptopia. And uh, also things change because everything becomes the ocean. But things change rapidly even with only 20 events if we let our PDFs change a little bit. I told you that we are in a situation with a box distribution, a nice uh, uh, distribution, which is never realized in, 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 in real life. Because you have always smearings. The CNGS beam, as good as they can make it, will never be an exact box distribution. There is a jitter effect. Some protons arrive a little bit earlier, and then there is a flat top, and then there is a jitter that goes down. So that jitter is a smearing of the box distribution. And how is a smearing uh, modeled? Well, you can model a, a smearing with a Gaussian spread. So each time in measurement, it's not exactly equal to the others also, because you can have uh, some slight uncertainties. And uh, so there are several effects that make your PDF not exactly a box and resemble a little bit more a Gaussian. But how much is that? How, how, much, how big is this effect? And how much does it affect our conclusions? So. The biases that can be present will not affect our conclusions for the, for the variance. They will cause offsets in the central value, but not 
conclusion shifts in our uh, validity of the UMVU. Instead, uh, the, the smearings will. So let's assume that the smearings are Gaussian. So we take a box PDF and we introduce a small smearing. So every time we generate a timing measurement from a box distribution, we also add a small nudge left or right with a Gaussian spread. And we do this uh, as a function of the width of this Gaussian smearing in nanoseconds that we add to our timing measurement. And so we see that the situation I was talking about is 1.7 versus 3.2 or something like that for sample mid-range versus sample mean uh, total expected uncertainty. But as we add the smearing, we see that the sample mid-range is, what is the property of estimators that plays in, in this case? What is the, estimate, the, the, the property that we discussed uh, that tells us uh, that an estimator remains good uh, when you vary the PDF from your assumption? Who remembers what is that property? It's called robustness. An estimator is robust if it varies uh, less when you vary the PDF from your assumption. And you see that the sample mean is much more robust than the sample mid range because the slope, when you change the PDF, well, this is unfair in a sense because the sample mean is based on the Gaussian assumption. And if you smear with a Gaussian spread, the Gaussian assumption, it remains a Gaussian. So it's a little bit unfair to say that this is a, a, a robust uh, a, an indication of robustness, but certainly the sample mid range is not very robust. And you see that if the spread is larger than six nanoseconds, you get in a situation where you should actually pick the sample mean and not the sample mid range as your best estimator. So, With 20 event samples, a Gaussian smearing with six nanoseconds sigma is enough to make the expected variance equal for the two estimators. And for larger ones, you should pick the sample mean. So I think that uh, after looking into the details of OPERA, I convinced myself that they should be in this range. So yes, we, they should have picked the sample mid range, but they didn't do such a bad uh, uh, mistake after all. But in my mind, they did. Why? Because it's not the effect of your mistake what counts. It's the fact that you have not thought it over well enough. Because I'm convinced that they didn't do this graph, which they could have made in 10 minutes of CPU of their brains, OK? And the 10 minutes of CPU of their laptops. So. To me, they are guilty because they didn't do this study, right? And that is the message. I think you have all the means with today's computing power to study the properties of your estimators in the exact experimental conditions on, under which you are working. And if you do, you will be able to brag with your colleagues that not only you have made the good measurements, but you can prove that it is the best measurement possible. This is very important, because otherwise, what are you there for? You are there to contribute to science and to do a little bit more with the equipment that you were given. They give you a million dollars to get a result that has the 3 nanosecond, 1.7 nanosecond uncertainty, and you spoil it and give the world the result with 3 nanosecond uncertainty. Well, I could have given you 250. $50,000, not a million dollars, to get that result because you have worsened the sigma by a factor of two. That means like having taken data for four times more. It costs to produce that beam that in, of neutrinos. It costs money, OK? And you are wasting all that money, all right? So I think uh, we can stop here. And um, if you have any questions, I'm here. You can also think it over 
coffee. And assail me during the coffee break. <laughs> Which I wouldn't like, but it's okay. No, it's okay if you come over. <laughs> yes? Which I asked uh, at the beginning of uh, today's session. Uh, how many of you had a chance to uh, uh, look at the problem uh, of this uh, two dimensional array made into one dimensional and the uh, shower uh, with, with Laplace distribution? Uh, uh, could I see a show of hands? Uh, how many of you could uh, could try it? Uh, well, the hands are there, but they are under the table. <laughs> <laughs> if you have done okay. it, just raise your hand. I think I, I, I can I can I have one word. Can I say something? I, I think it's very hard to study and uh, and to keep uh, working at night after such intense lectures. So I yes. personally forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. But it's uh, uh, it's. Uh, one week of intense learning for them. And... <laughs>